All right, welcome to the next Real Health webinar. This is 10 Steps to Renew Your Energy and Regain Your Life. Step number two, exercise regularly and the right amount. So as always, I'm your host, Dr. Taylor Crick with The Real Health Resource. And if you're just, you know, clicked on this webinar and you don't know, this is part of a series of webinars. It's 10 steps to renew your energy and regain your life. We started it off by doing one webinar where we went through each of the 10 steps just briefly. And then we're going into each of the steps more thoroughly in separate individual webinars and this is so this is you know with relation to your energy that is what we're talking about because i believe that americans have an energy crisis and i'm not talking about you know oil gas uh electric solar etc i'm talking about the energy to get through your life the energy to get to the gym the energy to play with your kids the energy to play with your spouse the energy to do the things that you want to do with love and with life and with vitality. Americans have an energy crisis. Now these first two webinars, step number one was eat a real food diet, and today is step number two, exercise regularly. And these are the two that I would say, if you went out you know, and polled 100 people and asked them, you know, should you eat well and should you exercise, 100% of the people are going to say, yeah, you should. Most people know this. But if you walk around, you follow them around, say, okay, well, let me, let me follow you for a week. Let me see how well you're doing with this. Most people are not doing very well at all. So everybody knows they should do it. I'm going to scroll through and say, yeah, you're about to do it. What I'm going to do is show you how this can affect your energy on a hormonal level, on a brain level, uh, and, and what regular exercise can do for you. And, I, and I'm also going to show you how you can do that. And I'm not going to say, hey, spend an hour, spend two hours at the gym. I'm going to show you the easiest way to make this happen anywhere so that you minimize your excuses, maximize your energy, and exercise regularly so that you can combat the energy crisis. One of the things that I like to, to point out is that you know a lot of our patients that come into our office they don't come in with, with low energy as their primary complaint. Now, there are you know, a certain percentage of people with chronic fatigue, with fibromyalgia, with hypothyroidism, with weight gain. You know, just adding 20, 30, 40 pounds to your frame zaps your energy. Put on 20 pound weights and try to walk up the stairs, it zaps your energy. But these things, you know, it could be the first two steps to boosting energy could be the first two steps to reversing heart disease, could be the first two steps to reversing diabetes, to regulating blood sugar, to, to beating or defeating autoimmune disease. Eating a real food diet and exercising regularly are just so important. There's very, very little, if anything, I don't know that there's anything, that exercise hasn't been shown to help. Now there's good ways of exercising and bad ways of exercising, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, but exercise really helps everything in your body function better. Your metabolism, your hormone control, your brain, which regulates your sleep cycles, and all the other eight steps that, that we're gonna talk about uh, are affected positively through exercise. That's why it's a foundation of real health. That's why it's one of the first two steps to renew your energy is to exercise regularly. So we live in, in a sedentary nation. Uh, so here's some stats on this. Uh, on average, Americans sit for 11 hours a day. So the average American is going to sit for uh, something like 30 years of their life. They're gonna be in a seated position and they're sedentary. Uh, 300,000 deaths occur annually each year, 300,000 deaths due to inactivity and poor dietary habits. So you look at step number one and step number two, and not just whether or not you have the energy to fulfill your, your day, but you know, are you going to die early? 300,000 people are because they're not moving and they're not eating well. 20%, one-fifth of all the deaths of people 35 and older are attributed to a lack of physical activity because physical activity has been shown to combat the main causes of disease. So that's a fifth of all our deaths are linked to that. 
65% uh, of Americans watch two or more hours of TV every day. Only 6.5% meet the physical guideline requirements for work, less than 10% there. $24 billion in direct medical spending from inactivity and sedentary lifestyles, and women more likely to lead sedentary lives than men. So what does this do? Well, what being sedentary does is it causes hormone disruption. And I want to pull that down for a second and just talk about this. They've, they've done studies where they've taken Olympic athletes, okay, some of the you know, most fit people on the planet, and they've made them sedentary in a, a day. They can measure a hormone shift, that their hormones begin to shift towards disease and away from health. Now, if they do that for one day, they're not you know, moving towards disease that rapidly, but you do that one day. Then you do it two days. Then you do it a week. Then you do it a month. Then you do it a year. Then you've worked a career at a desk job, and you're moving towards disease at a faster and faster rate. So it's about moving. You know, there's a big movement today uh, of standing desks. They say sitting is the new smoking. So people are getting standing desks. And what they found is that the standing desk isn't that much different. It's not about just being standing. It's about the movement and the motion. So I'm sitting here in a chair right now, but what you can't see is that before I record these webinars, I take the treadmill out of my office so it's not in the background, but usually it sits right back there in the corner and I have a treadmill that I hop on from time to time to just keep moving because it's not about the size of my muscles or how fast I can run a mile. It's about just constantly being moving because our bodies were designed to move. So being sedentary, what does that lead to? Well, sedentary lifestyle leads to hormone disruption. And if you watched the first webinar, that is you know, really the root of a lot of our, our chronic diseases today is inflammation and, and, and hormone disruption. Inflammation causes hormone disruption and hormone disruption causes weight gain, just as an example, and weight gain creates low energy. The hormones that we're talking about, you can see here, are things like insulin, that's your blood sugar uh, hormone, it's also your fat storage hormone, which you know, if you did not watch the last webinar, go back and watch it because we're talking about you know, spiking insulin, or go back and watch even our blood sugar webinar. Insulin is the fat producing hormone, it is the fat storage hormone, it is your wrinkles in your skin hormone, it is the arthritis in your knee hormone, it is the fuel cancer hormone. So these are some of the hormones that we're talking about. Now, diet is the main way to reduce insulin. If you are eating a high sugar diet and you switch to a low sugar diet, you're not going to spike insulin as much. Exercise has actually been shown to increase insulin sensitivity, which means that a little bit can go a longer way when you exercise. That's why some people can handle a higher sugar, higher carb diet. They don't gain weight, they don't get metabolic disease at the same rate as somebody that's sedentary. I don't recommend it, but somebody that's more insulin sensitive can handle you know, different amounts of foods in different ways. The second one there was leptin. Leptin is your fat burning hormone. So one's fat producing, fat storing, one's fat burning. Leptin sensitivity is increased with exercise as well. Uh, the other ones that are on there are thyroid and adrenal hormones. And exercise just makes you more hormone sensitive. If you look at an Olympic athlete again, they don't have more hormones. They don't have more testosterone, more estrogen, more thyroid hormone, more adrenal hormones. They're more sensitive to these things. They can hear them better. They can get the key in the lock. We talked on the last webinar that your hormones are like keys trying to get into your cells and unlock metabolic processes like the adrenal and thyroid hormones. Uh, adrenal, for example, produces a lot of energy. It's also stress hormones. And so if those hormones can't get into the cells, you can never unlock those processes. I use the analogy of pouring gas on a car. You're close, but you gotta get the gas in the car. You've gotta get your hormones in the cells. When you're hormone sensitive, it means that that lock unlocks really easily. You stick your key in and it just turns and you're just in the door. 
We've all jiggled with a, a, a bad lock, trying to get the key in right, trying to get it to turn. And finally, oh, we finally get it to turn. Well, that's inflammation. That's increased hormone sensitivity or decreased hormone sensitivity, rather, is when you can't get that lock into the keyhole, get that metabolic process unlocked. So anyway, that's a little bit of, you know, very, very brief hormones 101. But all these hormone problems zap your energy. And that is how exercise can be so beneficial to improve your energy is not just through losing weight or through, you know, boosting your metabolism, but by making your hormones and your cells more sensitive. So exercising the right amount uh, is a really important thing that I put on there because there's also the, the opposite, uh, exercising the wrong amount. Uh, and that's something called overtraining. So when you don't give your body enough recovery time, you find that it, it can cause a syndrome called overtraining, which zaps your adrenals. It's, it's basically adrenal fatigue for athletes or HPA axis dysfunction for athletes. But you think because you look a certain way or because you can lift a certain amount and run a certain amount, you think that you're healthy or maybe not you, but somebody thinks that they're healthy because you think, oh, well, look at that person. Look how healthy they are. But if you're eating a junk diet, you're living in our go, go, go lifestyle, you have stress hormones that are through the roof and you're not allowing your body enough time for rest and recovery, you go into something called overtraining which zaps your adrenal glands and your body's ability to produce the right amount of hormones that control your energy. And I've seen this many times. And what happens is, you know, somebody's in their low 20s and they can handle a heavy training load. But you just keep doing that, you keep doing that, you keep doing that. You keep whipping the horse of your adrenal glands. Eventually, it's going to collapse and give out on you. So exercising the right amount. This is the most prevalent in uh, like CrossFitters is a big one, but really more than CrossFit. I, I'm not a CrossFit hater by any means. I think it's a great exercise, but you know, not allowing your body doing CrossFit and, and then some. You know, doing two wads a day or really just gassing and zapping your body. Remember, with stress, you have your mental stress, you have physical stress, and you have chemical stress. Uh, and the physical stress is a big one. So if you you don't allow your body to recover. You're constantly spiking your stress hormones. So exercising the right amount, really important. Uh, weightlifters, heavy weightlifters and CrossFitters, people that are putting in like hours of training a day. And then the other one would be endurance athletes, especially ultra endurance athletes. You know, you go out and run three to five miles. They're not zapping your body that bad. You go out and run, you know, 20 miles a week. That's a stress on your body. You do marathon training, you do ultra marathon training, you're absolutely stressing your adrenals and stressing your body. And, and it does not boost your energy. In the long term, it's going to zap your energy. So I just want to cover that at the beginning. That's why I said exercise regularly is step number one, but the right amount is step number two. For most of us, for most people, it's just about getting out there and moving, getting out there and exercising. It's not a big concern, but if you are an athlete, I'll tell you some of the people that I've uh, dealt with that have experiences are some of the highest level athletes that I've ever met and that I've ever worked with in my office, um, adrenal fatigue and overtraining syndrome. So exercising the right amount uh, too much, it stresses the HPA axis and the adrenal glands. That is one of the upcoming webinars too, is the supporting the adrenal glands and the HPA axis. So if you're like, what does that mean? How, how can I know what that means? I think that I might have that. I think my son might have that. I think that I might've experienced that. Or say you're not an athlete and you, you've read something about adrenal fatigue, which I, I call it HPA axis dysfunction now, um, but still you know, in Google, terms adrenal fatigue adrenal burnout you've read about that you think you might have it well stay tuned for the later webinars because that is step number seven is support your adrenal glands and your hpa access we're going to talk about the hormones that those secrete we're going to talk about how to test those what supplements you can take to support those get some adrenal healing protocol uh tips and tricks there So what is the best type of exercise? What is my favorite type of exercise? Well, I love, you know, my answer to that is any, 
Any movement is good. Any exercise is good. This could be, uh, you know, gosh, I mean, name it, walking, running. Uh, sex is actually great physical exercise. Um, walking, running, biking, dancing. You know, I, a lot of people, especially here in Utah, you know, they hate exercise. Uh, like, I don't like exercising. It just so happens that I love skiing. I love biking. I love running. So I do things for fun that just also happen to be exercising. So find a, a hobby or a habit, you know, something that you just love doing and do that. But if you don't have one, you know, you don't have to force yourself to, to learn to love something. Like I, I hate walking. I, I, I'm not really a big fan of hiking. I like moving fast or I like sitting still. Um, but find something. And if you don't find anything, that's the time when you got to go to the gym. You got to get on the treadmill. You've got to get on the elliptical. You've got to get on the exercise bike. But my first choice would be find something that you love and, and find something that, you know, is fun, is fun for you to do. But any exercise is, is the answer for the best type. Now, I am going to give you my favorite type of exercise on the next slide, but any. So you can do walking, you can do running, lifting weights, swimming, skiing, biking. Um, all of these are beneficial for, for different reasons. And the way that I'm going to talk to you about exercising, you can use any of these types of exercise and do them in a specific way to get the most out of it. Uh, so you can really do anything. You can, I just had a patient last week and I said, she said exercise is her goal. She said, well, I have stairs in my condo uh, and that helps because I have to go up and down them several times. I said, hey, you know, I'm not going to say her name. I said, hey, I have commercial. You, know, you can sit and watch TV, but do you care about the commercials? She said, no. I said, at the commercial, just to form a habit, go up and down your stairs two times. Then the next week, go up and down them three times. And just use your commercial breaks to stand up and do some air squats, to go up and down your stairs, to get your arms and legs moving. Just get out of that sedentary position. There are a million ways to do this. There's no wrong way as long as you're moving and you're not overdoing it. But there's no, you know, for most people, just getting moving is going to be great. Now, you've got a hip replacement. You've got a knee replacement. You've got, you know, some chronic injury. That can always be modified. We do, you know, fitness and movement assessments in our office. It can always be modified. I've taught fitness plans to people that are in their 400-pound range, uh, people that have recent hip or knee replacements or elbow or shoulder surgeries. It, it, there's never an excuse to not exercising, so any of those types are good. But my favorite, my favorite type of exercise is called surge exercise, surging or bursting. And what that means is going hard, then resting, then going hard again. It's also known, you know, especially if you look on Google or something, you might not find it under surging, but H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training is what it's called. And so what this does is, you know, if you think about your body having to adapt, your body is always having to adapt to different situations and different circumstances. And that's a really good thing. You want your body to be a quick adapter. But let's say you're going to go for a 45 minute run on the treadmill. You're going to keep it at 4.0 miles per hour. Well, your body has to adapt from baseline, has to go up to here, and then it stays 4.0 miles an hour for an hour. There's no adaptation. You're still giving your heart, giving your lungs, giving your muscles a workout. You're still getting things moving. Your blood's moving. Your lymph is moving. But the adaptation is so crucial. So what I prefer is surging. So let's use the treadmill example again. You go up. You go hard. 30 seconds to a minute. Your body has to adapt. Then you stop. Come to a dead stop. Your body has to try to adapt to rest. Has to lower the heart rate. Has to lower the breathing rate tries to lower the blood pressure, but then you go again and it adapts. Then you go down and it adapts. Then you go again and it adapts. Then you go down and it adapts. Then you go up and it adapts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what this high intensity interval training has been shown to do is change your hormones. It boosts two hormones called HGH, human growth hormone and testosterone. These are muscle building and fat burning hormones. And it doesn't just boost them during your 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of exercise. 
what the research shows on this surge type exercising is that it boosts it for 24 to 36 hours afterward. Now, another thing, stress hormone, cortisol, it gets boosted with exercise. So if, you, if you're exercising for 45 minutes or an hour, you're an endurance athlete, you're here, your stress hormone is high, high, high the whole time, and it stays elevated afterward. When you do these quick burst exercises that aren't as, high, as long duration, it can decrease the stress response while increasing your hormone sensitivity to those stress hormones. So it, it's a hormonal change. It's not about that it builds the biggest muscles, even though it does help with that because it boosts HGH and it boosts testosterone. Lifting weights does, does the same thing, has the same boost. But the surging, and I'll show you, you know, just pulling up the last slide, like let's go back to here, walking. You can surge walk. I have patients that will walk, the, walk their neighborhood at night. They'll pick out a mailbox, you know, 10 houses away, and they'll surge. They'll speed walk to that mailbox. Then they'll slow down. You can do it with running. I have patients that do surge exercises on a treadmill. They run for a certain amount of time, then they stop. Lifting weights kind of already is surging because you go hard, then you take a little break, then you go back. Swimming, you can do it with swimming. It's hard with swimming because you feel like you're going to die, and then you have to stop and take a break, and then you go back to, to swimming hard laps, but you exert your body hard. We're going to talk about how hard do you exert in a second. Skiing kind of is surging. You know, something like uh, basketball or soccer or tennis, those are inherently surge exercises because you have to, you know, the ball goes to the left, you have to go to the left. The ball goes to the right, you have to go to the right. The ball goes out of bounds, you rest. Then you serve it up, you play again. But, you know, a lot of sports, and the reason that they're so beneficial is because you are surging. You're getting an aerobic exercise but you're also using your anaerobic systems too, the ones that go really fast. You gotta go to the left, you gotta go to the right, you gotta drive to the hoop for a shot, or you gotta play hard defense for a second. You're using a combination of your aerobic, which means you know lungs, oxygen-fueled, aerobic capacity, and your anaerobic, which are like your muscles or your quick bursts of exercise. You're using a combination of those, getting your body to adapt and readapt and adapt and readapt really really great for you so surge exercising going hard then resting then going hard again and i'll give you a sample at the end of my favorite way to, to pull this off but it can be really easy it can be really cheap um free 99 i just had a patient in today she said oh i did a, a surge exercise yesterday morning just in my house with, with nothing available to me i just did a surge and that's the way that this should become is that there are no excuses. The only excuse is that you don't have the energy. And, and that's kind of the point of this, is that it's a vicious cycle that you don't have the energy, so you don't get to the gym, you don't get out of bed to do your workout, and then all of a sudden you have even less energy, so you're not going to next time. When you break that cycle, you start to increase your energy, you're way more likely to pull this off. So surging, um, what you want to look at is your target heart rate zone, okay? And, and this is a chart of how to determine that. So when you are surging, like I said, you can surge any which way. And like I use the example of patients that, that maybe walk the block, they're probably not getting into their target heart rate zone, but it's still good for the adaptation period. But when you go as hard as you can to the maximum, you get your heart rate into its target zone, then you come down and rest, that's when you're gonna see the biggest hormonal shift. They've actually measured that you can see this hormonal shift in as little of, as four minutes of exercise by going hard, resting, going hard, resting, doing your surge type exercises in as few as four minutes. So what does that look like? Well, you know, this, this is all based on your age. So your max heart rate is determined at, with a simple formula that's 220 minus your age. So if you're 20 years old, your max heart rate is 200. If you're 40 years old, your max heart rate is 180. Pretty generic formula, but, but pretty accurate when you look at these numbers and for the zone. 
So getting up into you know a 75 to 85 percent, I would say look at this higher number in this target heart rate zone. Now if you're maybe doing your walking surges, you want to get at least into the 100 range here, but you're 50 percent of your max. But for a 20 year old, 100 beats per minute is not that strenuous. Um, so you want to get into this higher number here. So over here is the maximum at 100 percent. Um, if you're just, you know, busting it to the point of exhaustion, here is your heart rate. So 200 for a 20 year old, 180 for a 40 year old, 160 for a 60 year old, so on and so forth. But the target heart rate is where you want to get to look for this 85% number, you know, 70 to 90% of your max heart rate is a good place to be, but as close to this max heart rate as you can get. So let's say you are 40, let's say you're 30. I am, that's the closest number that, that I am to. So 162 beats per minute is at 85% of my target heart rate zone. So if I get up to 160 beats per minute, I know that I'm really exerting myself, my 85% of my max. Now you don't want to max out because you're not going to last that long. But let's say I'm surging and I get up to 180. That's perfectly fine. It's under my max. I'm at like 90% of my max heart rate there. And, and that's really, really good. Um, say you're 50 years old. Your max is 170. So if you get up to 160, 165, you're getting pretty close to your max heart rate. Uh, your goal should not be any higher than 170. But your target zone, you want to be at least 85. But 85 for a 50-year-old is probably like you know walking up a, a flight of stairs or maybe walking to their car after work very low um, effort, but the 145 number, that's more where you want to be, 145, 150, 160, to you know, 80 to 90, 70 to 90% of your target heart rate or of your max heart rate. So if you're a 70 year old, 130, 140 is really good strenuous exercise. You're getting up close to your max of 150 beats per minute. So for you know, two people doing a surge workout at the same time, they're not going to be putting forth the same effort. And we've done, you know, we do surge workouts in, in our office and I've seen, you know, uh, a, a kid come in and they're doing jumping jacks and they're flying through. The parent is with them and they're doing jumping jacks and they're, you know, moving pretty quick, but, you know, not nearly what the kid is doing, like energize your bunny. And the grandparent is with them as well. And they're slower, but they're all might be at the same output for their age. And that's really, really important to note is that it's not a race between any of us. You know, there's a, a, an amazing book out there. It's called Spark by John Rady. He's a, a MD. He talks about the, the beneficial effects of exercise on the brain. And in the intro to the book, the beginning of the book, he talks about a specific school district in Chicago where they measure kids. They give each kid a PE class a heart rate monitor, and they measure them on their energy expenditure, but it's not who can run the mile the fastest. The first person to cross the finish line isn't the winner. It's, it's based on you and your design and your age and your weight and your ability and where your heart rate is at. You know, if two high schoolers run a six minute mile, one of those high schoolers might be at 175 beats a minute. Uh, one of them might be at 150 beats a minute. And it's not to say that one is better than the other, but one is exerting more effort for the given result for that six minute mile. So it's really important to know your heart rate, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to wear a Fitbit or a heart rate monitor. First off, you can check it yourself. You can check it in your neck. You can check it in your wrist. But when you're exercising hard, it's, it, it's hard because it's like, you know, trying to count those beats is really tough. So, you know, a wearable Fitbit might, might be beneficial, a heart rate monitor might be beneficial. We can also get the feel for this too. You know what it feels like to be gassed or exhausted. If your hands are going down on your knees, you're, you're gasping for air, you feel like you've worked yourself to exhaustion, you're above and into that target heart rate zone of 70 to 90%. Um, like the 85, uh, you know, 50 year old at 85 beats per minute, that might be just walking out to your car, very low exertion level. So you want to be with surging. The, the most effective 
way to know that you're doing it right is you want to be gassed. You want to be to exhaustion. Even if you do it for 20 seconds, by the end of that 20 seconds, you want to be thinking, man, I need a rest. And then you get a rest. You rest for 20 seconds. Your body says, okay, we can do that again. You go again. 20 seconds hard. Think, oh, man, I need a rest. Then you take a rest. Then you go hard. So you go to a mini point of exhaustion each time. Adapt, rest, adapt, rest, adapt, rest. So my favorite time to exercise, you know, once again, the answer to that is any, but morning. Uh, morning is my favorite time to exercise. Um, and, and not, you know, for me personally, you know, I, I really would like, just based on my schedule and things, I, I would prefer to go at night just because I have more time and my, my kids have gone to sleep and things like that. But it's not as good for me. So two, two times a week, usually I, I ski. Uh, I get up at 4.15 in the morning and I ski and I climb a couple thousand miles, a couple thousand miles, a couple thousand feet, ski down, get my workout in in the morning. Um, but that's not always the most convenient, but it is the most beneficial. So I'll explain to you some of the reasons why, especially when it comes to your energy. Now, once again, any time is better than no time. So if you are only available in the evenings, that's not to say, oh, shoot. Dr. Taylor just gave me an excuse not to exercise. Uh, I can't do it in the morning. It's just not happening. Myself personally, and just you know the way that I'm wired, I would prefer to do it at night, but it is better in the morning. Uh, here's a couple reasons why. One, you get it out of the way. Um, so you're not, you know, as your day goes on, more and more excuses are gonna pop up. Uh, oh, I have this, oh, I have this, oh, I. I just got a flat tire. Oh, I just, I've got to pick my kids up from soccer. You know, more and more things are going to pop up. But if you do it right away in the morning, you get it out of the way. It's downhill from there. Um, it also spikes cortisol at the right time. So with exercise, you do have a rise in your stress hormone cortisol. And, and we're going to talk about this a lot on webinar number seven, because this is the adrenal glands and the HPA axis measures cortisol over the course of a day to measure if your adrenals are fatigued or they're burnt out. And if you look at cortisol over the course of the day, it's high over here at seven, eight in the morning, and then it goes down during the day. So if your cortisol is dropping down during the day, you go for a hard exercise at six o'clock at night, you're spiking it up. Now it's going to come back down, but still you're spiking it, causing disrupted hormone cycles. Uh, the next webinar, two webinars from now, webinar number four is on resetting your sleep cycles. And we all know about our circadian rhythms. We all know about, you know, being more awake in the morning and, and more asleep at night is how we should be. And that our bodies are, are have rhythms. And so exercising in the morning can help you continue with a healthy rhythm or can help you reset your rhythm if your sleep is off, if you're somebody that's what's called wired and tired, you're, you're tired in the morning when you wake up, but at night you're wired and you can't fall asleep. Your cycles are disrupted, your hormone cycles, and so exercising in the morning can help with that. But you spike cortisol uh, at the right time, you get it out of the way. You regulate energy cycles like your, your melatonin, uh, which isn't necessarily an energy cycle per se, but if you aren't sleeping well, that's the most obvious cause for poor energy. We all know what it feels like to be tired and not get enough sleep. So melatonin and your sleep cycles can be regulated for that reason that I just talked about with spiking cortisol at the right time. And then the biggest thing is it pours rocket fuel on your brain. And, and I don't mean literally like rocket fuel, but figuratively, that's the analogy that they use when you exercise in the morning, just by getting moving, it changes your melatonin cycles, just even slight movement um, by, by you know, working out in the morning. But it, it increases some things in your brain, like what's called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Another one is called VEGF, vascular, vascular endothelial growth factor. These are very, very beneficial hormone neurotransmitters that 
it, 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 use the analogy of pouring rocket fuel on your brain or pouring miracle grow on your brain. It causes you to be sharper, sharpens your cognitive skills, sharpens your energy and alertness, not just right after the workout, but throughout the rest of the day. So that is by far the best time to exercise is the morning. But like I said, I don't want you to use that as an excuse. If you can only do it in the evening, any exercise is much, much better than no exercise. But the best thing is just, you know, exercising regularly and staying moving throughout the day. But at least once, you know, a day or every other day, giving your body a good hard workout like these surge workouts to where you're changing your hormones, getting a good one in in the morning is, is you know, the preference. So here's a, a sample surge workout. This is my favorite. This is the type that we teach in the office. This is on a, a DVD that we sell here in the office to a similar type of workout, um, but just a really easy formula. So you pick six exercises, okay? And I'll show you my sample here in a sec. Six exercises. You're going to repeat each one three times. For each exercise, you're going to go 20 seconds of on, then you're going to take 20 seconds of rest. That's one time. Then you're going to repeat three times. So it's 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off once. 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off twice. 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off three times. Repeat each exercise three times for 20 seconds uh, each time. And that's 12 minutes total. So if you think about it, you're doing 20 second exercise, then 20 second break. So half the time, you are resting. So it's 12 minutes total, which is only six minutes of exercise with six minutes of rest. Now that is perhaps mind blowing to you um, and, and to a lot of people if I say, hey, what if I tell you that you can get fit, you can lose weight, you can get the benefits of exercise from exercising 12 minutes a day? Do you have 12 minutes a day? Like, yeah, my gosh, I could do that. But if I say, you know, you, you're only exercising for six minutes, you need 12 minutes of time, but you're only going to be going for six minutes. Do you think you can do that? A hundred out of a hundred people are going to say yes. So everybody has the ability to make this a reality. They just don't see it. They have their blinders on because they're not seeing that, that it's possible for them. I've seen people lose over a hundred pounds with combining some of these principles, dietary principles and exercise principles, changing their hormone sensitivity, decreasing their inflammation. I've seen hundreds of people lose 20, 30, 40 pounds. Uh, some people go on further to lose 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, but I've seen hundreds of people lose dozens of pounds. And really, really quickly, you know, I've seen people, you know, do a 30 day, 28 day challenge, lose 25, 26 pounds by combining these principles. Uh, and that's really what, what we're teaching them to do is a 12 minute surge workout. So 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off. Uh, so here's what this looks like is here's exercise number one. I'm going to put six exercises. I'll just put them all up. Actually, I'll explain them. Air squats. Air squats is just squatting down um, and standing up. Okay. So if you've got a bad hip, you've got a bad knee, maybe you don't go down as deep. But if you don't go down as deep, that means that you can go faster. So you can modify this to anybody. Air squats. Jumping jacks is number two. Most people know about that one from grade school. They know what a jumping jack looks like. Uh, that can be modified to it. I, I really love the modified version. I'm not going to stand up and do it. But um, a jumping jack is both hands, both feet at the same time. Modified, you still do both hands, but you go left foot, right foot, left foot right foot you can't see my feet right now but you get the point you're not jumping there's not impact you're not bouncing you're not slamming down on your knees and your hips but you can still move really fast left foot right foot left foot right foot and you can actually get you know sometimes a better workout uh with doing the modified version than with a, a strict strict jumping jack one of my favorites really basic lunges are the next one so once again you don't your knee doesn't slam to the ground but you stick your leg uh, in front of you and you squat down and then you put bring them back together then you stick your right leg in front of you and you squat down you bring them back together then left leg in front squat down that's a lunge if you don't know what a lunge is 
Google it, you'll get you know 500 results in a second. Good mornings. Uh, this is a great, great, great one. We love this one in the office because when we do a workout class, people will say, well, this one feels like it's not doing anything because you're not as exhausted. Air squats, jumping jacks, your heart, your lungs, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be breathing. Good mornings, you feel like nothing's happening. And then you come to me on Monday morning and you say, oh my gosh, I couldn't get out of my church pew on Sunday. I couldn't stand up off the toilet because my butt was so sore. So a great, great workout is called a, a good morning. Um, and you can look that up if you're interested with what that is. Uh, but a great full or a body weight workout. Number four, high knees, kicking your knees up and you don't need to run in place. You can just bring one knee up, left knee up, right knee up, left knee up, right knee up. Well, you're going as fast as you can to exhaustion and then you're resting for 20 seconds. So for 20 seconds, left knee, right knee, left knee, right knee, left knee, right knee. Then when, when the timer says time, then you stop. And number six, squat jacks. Uh, that is combining number one and number two. You get into a squat position and then you do jumping jacks. This is a real workout that we're gonna put people through in our, in our office and that we've done before. And I'll tell you, you do this workout 12 minutes and, and, and I don't care who you are, we've had you know high level athletes, we've had kids, we've had people, you do these workouts and you put, a, like I said, a grandparent next to a parent next to a kid, they can all do them to different levels and different exhaustion levels and, and different speed levels. But if they all exert themselves as hard as they can, they are all going to be sore and they are going to feel it. You're going to know that you did a workout. Now, for some of you, being sore is not your goal. You don't, it's not about the, the soreness by any means. We're not trying to punish people. But it does tell you that, you know, in 12 minutes and six minutes of exercise, you're getting a really good workout. Your heart and your lungs are gassed. You're getting a good cardiovascular workout, an aerobic workout. But at the same time, you know that your muscles are rebuilding and building stronger because you can feel the soreness. So those six exercises, and you go 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off. Air squats, 20 seconds, 20 second rest. Air squats, 20 seconds, 20 second rest. Air squats, 20 seconds, 20 second rest. Now, I like to do all three right in a row because then you don't forget. Right? Where, where, where did I leave off? Just do three air squats, then three jumping jacks, then three lunges. You could easily do 20 seconds of air squats, then rest. 20 seconds of jumping jacks, then rest. 20 seconds of lunges, then rest. And you repeat all six of these three times. You could absolutely do that too, but for confusion um, sake, I, I like to do three at a time. And then we end with squat jacks, which is the most brutal one. You're definitely going to be sore from, from this sample surge workout. And the bottom line is, you know, there are no excuses. Uh, anybody can pull this off, can pull an exercise off. But at the same time, I mean, everybody's human. Most people think they get enough exercise. They don't. If you're just trying to get, you know, 10,000 steps on your Fitbit a day, good job. You're hitting the baseline. You're moving. Your body is designed to move. You have to move. You can't be sedentary. You work at a desk job, set a timer every 60 minutes, get up and move. Movement is not exercise. Movement is just movement. It's just a basis of life. Exercise is going above and beyond. Working up a sweat, getting your body moving. Sweat is an excellent way of detoxifying. But in our country, we think, oh, I don't like to sweat. I don't want to smell. So we hold toxins in. Working up a sweat, getting your heart, getting your lungs moving above normal above you know flight of stairs doing that repeatedly and regularly is absolutely necessary but for so many of us it's just it's a vicious cycle that you're stuck in and so what you have to do is break the vicious cycle the vicious cycle creates low energy and your low energy creates the vicious cycle when you are low energy how many people with low energy with fatigue want to go to the gym you know never uh nobody's going to want to so you have to force yourself to and when you break that cycle it's going to change your energy 
so that next time it makes it easier and easier. So we'll pull up this slide with the vicious cycle uh, and what you have to do. So inactivity, not exercising, being sedentary leads to low energy. Your body's just not moving as much. Your hormones aren't as sensitive. You may be put on, you know, 20 or 30 pounds, you, and it leads to low motivation. And that's not your fault. That is in your brain. That is, you know, neurotransmitter imbalance. You have low motivation. You don't want to exercise. So then you don't exercise. You're more inactive. You get more low energy. And you can see if that was a circle, it's a cycle that keeps going and going and going. So what you have to do is you have to break the cycle. You have to exercise. You have to force yourself to exercise. Now, after one time, it's going to be beneficial. But when you do it regularly is when it's really, really, really going to be beneficial. So then you do that regularly. It begins to regulate your hormones. It begins to make you more hormone sensitive. You begin to lose weight. You begin to you know, shed that 20-pound weight vest. You begin to regulate your hormones, regulate your neurotransmitters, all these things that lead to increased energy. And then you use that increased energy for more activity. But if you're not breaking the cycle, you're always going to be stuck in this pattern of, oh, I don't want to exercise because I don't have the energy. you gotta st you got to force yourself to break the cycle so that you can start getting your energy back. Now, one caveat that I'd like to throw in is if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, if you have a mitochondrial disorder, if you have fibromyalgia, these are some of the bigger ones that you might not be able to exercise. And I mean that literally, you might have a hard time getting out of bed. If that's you, that's not who I'm talking to here. If that's you, you need to start with some of the other steps. I can't tell you how many patients I've had with chronic fatigue, with fibromyalgia, with tired all the time syndrome, with all these chronic conditions, and they can't exercise. They can hardly sweep their floor or vacuum their house, and they can barely get out of bed in the morning. Uh, their kids know to come to their bedside to see them. You know, all these horrible life situations that we've helped people reverse help people change but it wasn't like hey get your butt to the gym you're lazy it wasn't that at all and i'm not saying that to anybody there really are physiological hormonal chemical causes for this it does start with eating a real food diet but sometimes you have to look to the thyroid look to the adrenals look to the gut look to the cells before you can get somebody exercising this webinar exercising regularly is for the other 90% of the population that don't have a diagnosed disease, don't have a diagnosed condition, can work out, and it's not completely zapping them. If you do a 20-minute workout and you need three days of sleep to recover, your body is not ready for exercise. There are other things going on there. So I'm not saying that, that exercise and diet is a magic pill, a magic bullet for everybody, but it is absolutely where everybody needs to start. And if you're already beyond that point, then what you need to start with is by getting a coach, getting a, a practitioner, a doctor, a physician uh, to help put the pieces of this puzzle together. You don't need another medication. You don't really need a, another medical doctor's visit. You need a coach, somebody that's going to walk you through this, help you put the pieces of your puzzle together so that you can change this. Um, so pull up my last slide here. Uh, stay tuned. The next webinar, remember step number one was eat a real food diet. Step number two, exercise regularly. The next webinar is step number three, reduce your stress. And in particular, we're going to talk about your stress hormones. What can you do to reduce those stress hormones that are absolutely circulating in your body? What can you do right now, right where you are, to decrease those? But if you are you know, the person that I, I just talked to, you're somebody that says, well, gosh, I want to boost my energy, but I can't get out of bed. I can't get off the couch. I, I, I can't get to the gym. Well, then that is somebody that you need to contact us. So go to www.realhealthresource.com. That's where the other webinars are hosted, where our podcast is hosted. It's where our you know, store is. 
Um, every, all the resources are there for real health. That's why it's called Real Health Resource. And you can look into our real health coaching packages. Uh, that includes two monthly Skype calls or video calls with me, looking at your life in detail, taking a detailed history, seeing where you're at, what your goals are, where you want to go, and being your accountability partner along the way as we help you put those pieces of the puzzle together. It also includes a discount, 10% off any supplements purchased from our store, 10% off any lab testing purchased through us. Uh, so it, it's a very affordable health coaching program. But you can also send me an email if you're watching these webinars, you have any questions, you want to, to know just you know, a quick thing here or there, make sure to send me an email. I'll put that slide back up. Uh, and then stay tuned for the, for the next webinar. This is number two, so there are a lot more to come. And watch all of them, I'd say. They're all gonna be packed full of content. So there's my email, Taylor at realhealthresource.com. And we will talk to you all on the next webinar, Reduce Your Stress Hormones.